We're continuing our series in 1 Corinthians. Uh, the series is called Bodybuilding. And of course, we're not talking about physical bodybuilding, just getting stronger and bigger muscles. We're talking about getting bigger hearts, bigger characters, uh, more advanced development in the way that we love God and we love other people. And um, so we're going through it chapter by chapter. And it's a difficult one this week. Uh, but we're committed to go through the Word of God. The, one, the beauty of going through a letter in the New Testament like 1 Corinthians is we touch on a lot of different topics and a lot of different important subjects that otherwise would get ignored are going to be talked about. So I want to show you one of uh, uh, the heroes, another hero in Christian history in America, a Christian bodybuilder. This uh, man is named Jonathan Edwards. He only lived 55 years, 1703 to 1758. He founded Princeton University. But what he's more famous for is a message he gave, I believe it was in 1739, called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And his message was one of the catalysts for revival, for one of the great awakenings in colonial America that prepped us for the coming American Revolution and making a Christian America during the revolution all the way up through the time of the Constitution. So Jonathan Edwards is a great spiritual hero, and not only just because he founded Christian or Princeton University and he promoted a young evangelist that came to America and did an awesome job uh, named George Whitfield. Uh, Jonathan Edwards also uh, is known for his spiritual legacy because more Christian pastors and leaders and senators and governors uh, came from he and his wife's legacy than from just about any other individual in colonial America. He has a great spiritual legacy, not just for living a great life himself, but the influence that he had on generations to come. All right, let's keep moving forward. What are we looking at next? Okay, not that. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll continue on. How to deal, today's message is how to deal with the scandal in church. And because it is so sensitive, I, I want us to stop and pray together. Heavenly Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would be with us here in a powerful way. God, have your way with us. And uh, we pray that your word would go forth in truth, in power, in love, in grace. And Lord, whatever that you are calling us to maybe stop doing or start doing in our lives, as a result of hearing this, Father, we pray that, our, that we'd have an openness and a yes in our spirit to whatever you're calling us to do, because we know that it's going to be for our own blessing and for your glory. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. How to deal with a scandal in the church. You know, what about in your own family? Uh, maybe you could uh, do a little self-diagnosis in your own family and the way that your family handles problems. Lisa and I come from far different backgrounds when it comes to families and our problems. Uh, I don't mean to say that my family doesn't have problems and hers does. That's not what I'm really saying, all tongue in cheek. Our, our families, we both have problems in our families. The difference is that her family tends to run toward the problem. They don't see conflict as a, pro as, a, as a problem or as a, ooh, conflict. That's the worst thing that could happen in a family. We, uh, it's better just to avoid it. It's better to walk around it. If there's an elephant in the room, it's better to just deny it and go, la, 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 everything's fine. Um, so if there is a problem in your family, maybe your family doesn't have problems. But if there, hypothetically, if there were a problem in your family, uh, how would you tend to deal with it? Would you try to address the problem immediately and get everybody together and talk about it? Or would you ignore it? Or would you deny it? Or would you run away? Um, the Apostle Paul seems to be the kind of character that doesn't run away from a problem. When he sees a major problem that is threatening the health and the life of a church, Paul is going to go straight at it, and that's what he does today with a major problem and a scandal that was going on in the church. Last chapter, Paul talked about being their spiritual father in Christ. Remember, he said, even though you have 10,000 guardians, you only have one spiritual father because through the gospel, when Paul came to the city of Corinth and began preaching the gospel, when he, as the song we just sang, when he boasted in nothing but Jesus Christ 
and him is Lord and him crucified. When Paul came and gave them that message of life and they responded in faith and became followers of Jesus, Paul became their spiritual father. And now he's going to act like their spiritual father because the spiritual father doesn't just say, hey, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Sometimes the spiritual father needs to bring some discipline into the family when the family gets wayward. And so now Paul shifts gears from talking about being their spiritual father in the faith, and now he has to confront head on a scandal that's going on in the church. First, he has to confront the scandal itself, and then second, he, Paul has to confront the poor way in which the church was dealing with the scandal. So he says this beginning in chapter 5. I can hardly believe the report about the sexual immorality going on among you, something that even the pagans don't do. Can you imagine shocking the Corinthian culture with the sexual scandal that was going on in the church, something even the pagans wouldn't do? It's, a, it's amazing even to, to fathom in a, in a city as, as bad uh, morally as Corinth. He says, I am told that a man in your church is living in sin with his stepmother or with his father's wife. Literally, a man has his father's wife. Now, now if you were a person reading this chapter in the New Testament and you didn't know much about the Christian faith, or if you're a person sitting here or listening online and you don't know much about the Christian faith, I can imagine one of your immediate uh, reactions to this. Some of you might immediately think, hey, where, why are these Christians getting into other people's bedrooms? Isn't there some kind of right of privacy that everyone is entitled to? Why is the church so concerned with people's private sex lives? That's a good question, and I want to address it. And I want to go back and remind uh, of what the Christian faith is all about. When someone comes to a time in their life when they commit themselves to following Jesus, what that means is they are now submitting themselves. If you are really becoming a follower of Christ, you are submitting yourself to Jesus' authority, right? Do you remember the three chairs that we had in that illustration? And the one chair had self on the throne and Jesus was sort of in my life. I'm glad that he's in my life, but I'm running my life. You know, that's, that's a carnal Christian, in, in what the, the New Testament language would describe a person like that as. What we want in our lives as a Christian is, is we have a chair representing the throne of our life or who's in charge, and we want Jesus to be on the, in, sitting in the chair. And we want ourselves and our self-will to be over on the side. He's the leader. We are the follower. What he says goes. We're following Jesus' teachings as best we understand them. We are trying to live out the life Jesus calls us to live, he came to give us abundant life, right? And so as our leader and Lord, Jesus can tell us what right behavior is, and he also has the right to tell us what wrong behavior is. And yep, one of the big areas that the Lord Jesus has the right to address and to direct us in is in the area of our sexuality. Jesus says that there is right sexual behavior and there is wrong sexual behavior. There's right behavior that honors God and there's other kinds of sexual behavior that he prohibits because he knows that that wrong sexual behavior, it's not just going to harm us, it's going to harm other people and eventually it's going to harm the whole community of the church. In this case here in Corinth, sexual immorality, the, 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 the specifics of this case is that a Christ follower or somebody who says he's a Christ follower in the church, he is sleeping with his own stepmother, his father's wife, and Jesus prohibits that kind of sexual activity. So Paul, as an apostle, as an official ambassador of Christ, he calls the church out to respond to it. There's a big problem in God's church today when there is blatant sexual immorality going on in the church, and it's known to all the church. Even the pagan culture around the church disapproves of it, and the church leadership is just indifferent or is not willing, not having the courage to address it. Corinth was known as a city for loose and lascivious living. That sexual sin of the city culture, that attitude toward sexuality, it had just moved right in and taken place right in the living room of the church. And the church wasn't just not stopping it, this church wasn't even bothered by it. So we have two big problems in the church. 
First, you have the sexual immorality going on in the church. And then number two, you have the church's indifference to it. Look what Paul says in verse two. You are so proud of yourselves, he says. But instead of being proud of yourselves, you should be in mourning and in sorrow and shame. You should remove this man from your fellowship. Uh Uh-oh, we're talking about removing somebody from the fellowship of the church? You're talking about kicking somebody out? You're talking what, what over the centuries the, the church has, has, has labeled uh, discipline in such forms as excommunication or disfellowshipping, or maybe if you're an Amish background, shunning an individual. Is that what Paul is talking about? I think he is. It's one thing to be appropriately ashamed of your own wrong behavior, sin that is ongoing, but you're keeping it a secret. You're keeping it in hiding. You don't want anybody to find out because you know it's wrong. But it's a whole nother thing when this Corinthian congregation is not only aware of this sexual sin going on, they're openly tolerant of it. They're boasting about it. Uh, And that is a big problem. These church members were actually proud of this man's behavior. Freedom in Christ, they would proclaim. Or, or who cares what a Christian does with their own body and the privacy of their own home? Or what a Christ follower does in their own bedroom with whomever? That's their own business. And yet God says this. In fact, we're going to get to it next week in the next chapter. But at the end of chapter 6, God says these words very clearly. He says, you do not belong to yourself. For God bought you with a high price. So you must honor God with your body. God is for your bod. And he wants you to honor him with your body. And so friends, what kind of church discipline? If if Paul says this is unacceptable behavior and we have to address it, I'm calling it out. Call a spade a spade, call a sin a sin. What kind of church discipline do you think would be appropriate here? Paul says here unequivocally, you should remove this man from your fellowship. And as I just said, this is called, and it's been called uh, other terms too, but mainly the big three. This has been called excommunication or getting out of communication with somebody. That's what the Catholic Church is known for. That's what the Catholic Church uses as one of their primary uh, modes of discipline in a Catholic's life. Uh, There's what we call more in the evangelical church, there is this term called disfellowshipping or saying we are no longer going to fellowship with this person for a time uh, as a form of discipline to try to get them to turn around to turn around and turn away from their sin and then of course from an Amish background I even I heard I was reading online the Church of Scientology uses this term as well shunning an individual of saying we're not going to be in communication with that the people in the church who say at least publicly say, I am a Christ follower, who, sub, who said they are committed to the Christian way of life, uh, there are certain standards of behavior that we subscribe to. And good church leadership sometimes means that there needs to be some form of discipline to be exercised. I was reading in uh, the Presbyterian uh, confession and their, their doctrine, their creeds. And one of their uh, articles of faith says this, for a church to be a true church of Christ, it needs to practice at least three things. The first thing that the church, in order to be a true church, if you're a true church, number one, you have to be preaching the true gospel of Jesus Christ, according to the New Testament. Second, to be a true church, you have to be exercising uh, and, and practicing the sacraments that the Lord Jesus uh, laid out for us. The two sacraments we have in the New Testament are baptism, when you first come into the church and you publicly declare your faith in Christ, and communion, which is something we celebrate every week. So, uh, so you have to be preaching the true gospel, you have to be practicing the sacraments, and number three, in order to be a true church, you have to be exercising discipline over wayward members and bringing discipline into their lives. If you don't have that, you are not a true church. So it's a not, it's, that's not an easy bar to, to, to hold up to. 
because people are going to yell freedom in Christ, et cetera, et cetera, and they're going to bother you, and they're going to say, what right do you have to tell me how to live, et cetera, et cetera. So we have the right to tell people how to live because we are all following our Lord Jesus Christ, and supposedly we are all submitting to his authority. What he says is the way we should live, that's the lifestyle that we are subscribing to. And if somebody gets off track from that in any way, shape, or form, and by the way, later on in this chapter, we're going to see there's other forms of of not acting like Christians that also need to be disciplined, not just sexual immorality, then the church has an obligation to exercise discipline, to bring us back in line, to, bring, to be the guardrails for each other, to keep us on the straight and narrow path that God wants for us, right? So what we need to do is, uh, they, is we shouldn't discipline a wayward church member like this it's not just because we don't like him. It's not because we want to get rid of him. It's not because we're going to kick him out of our church forever and say, don't ever come back. But what we do want to do is exercise discipline in such a way that this man who's, who's being blatantly disobedient to the Lord's command, this man can stop in his tracks and really see the error of his own ways. You know, just to be clear, in the Christian church, we have certain standards of behavior. In fact, the Christian faith has a very simple standard for sexual behavior. Now, I say a simple standard. I didn't say it was an easy standard. There's a big difference between simple and easy. You know, love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. That's not really difficult to understand. It's really difficult to live out every day, right? One pastor said that the, the hardest part about the Christian life is that it is so daily you can have a great day yesterday, and you wake up this morning and be in a bad mood, and it's like, ah, man, I got to do, I have to do this all over again? Yes, every day is what we're called to live. So here are what God's rules for sex are. Very simple to understand, not easy to live out. God's rules for sex. Number one, God is the one who invented sex. He was the one who made us male and female. We follow the creative order given to us by God in Genesis. Male and female, he created them. And he said to be fruitful and multiply. He said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two of them will become one flesh. So God invented sex, and he said it was good. In fact, he said it was very good. Sexual relations, uh, number two, are approved by God in a committed and monogamous relationship between husband and wife. The two rules of sex between husband and wife is it needs to be exclusive and it needs to be permanent. In other words, it's not like uh, until our first argument doth us part, right? It, it, it's supposed to be permanent, right? So God invented sex. He approves of it in this manner. And number three, and this is where the simple gets complicated. God prohibits any sexual relations outside of the marriage relationship. That means before you get married, and that means while you are married. You have to be exclusive, and it needs to be permanent. And that is not an easy thing to live out. Now, in this case, how is this man uh, violating that? Well, he's engaged in sexual relations with this man and his father's wife, with his own stepmother. Now, I want to say this. Jesus and his salvation for us, when Jesus came to save us, he atoned for our sins on the cross. But when he did that, it, he didn't do that in order to free us so that we could sin. Jesus did that for us to free us so that we would be free from sin. Big difference. What did Paul say to the Christ followers in Rome? You know, when he's talking about sexuality, when he's talking about obedience to Christ, when he's talking about sin and grace, this is what Paul said to the Roman church. He said, shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? In Romans 6, verses 1 and 2, and you jump down to verse 11, and look what he says there, which we just had. Brief. There it is. Freeze. Okay. <laughs> in the same way, count yourself Count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. When there is a problem of sexual sin in the church and it's public, something has to be done to address it. There are certain behaviors that if left unchecked, those behaviors will infect and poison the rest of the congregation. And so Paul gives his judgment for disciplining the defiant sexual offender. He says, then you must throw this man out 
and hand him over to Satan. Wow, now that's a difficult phrase. And you can't just pass that on because uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't knowingly throw somebody into Satan's arms. That's not, a real, uh, that's not a real blessing, you know. Bless those who persecute you, you know. That's not a real blessing for somebody. But he says, throw this man out and hand him over to Satan. I think that's a phrase that's kind of a colloquialism that says, look, the, the holy place here on earth is God's church and God's people assembled together in God's church. And if a, a person is not willing to submit to, to following Christ and submitting to Christ's lordship in this area of his sexuality and it's public and he's defiant and he's not turning back from his sin, then you need to remove him from the fellowship of God's people. And out in the world, the Bible says that Satan is, or, or the Bible says in 1 John, the whole world lies in the lap of the evil one. So to throw somebody out of the church, at least temporarily, in order for them to wake up and hopefully repent and turn around, uh, in order to do that, that's where I think the term comes from, to hand that person over to Satan. So that, what's the purpose of disfellowshipping somebody like this in the church? So that his sinful nature will be destroyed and he himself will be saved on the day that the Lord comes. Charles Stanley uh, puts it this way. Uh, he says, many times we must allow people to bear the full ramifications of their actions without interfering in the hope that they will repent of their sin and turn to God. Let me tell you uh, what the whole point of disfellowshipping is. Why are we doing this? What is the purpose? When you say, kick somebody out of the church for a, for a period of time. What does that mean? Well, why are, why are we doing it in the first place? What are we trying to do to that person in, in, in a way to show them tough love rather than no love? Because I think in this point, the church is showing tough love rather than no love. And tough love is better than no love at all. Um, it says this, uh, it says the first point of disfellowshipping is to First one, and this is in your bulletin, so you can fill this in if you want. The first point is to shock the offending person of all involved, to shock them, to wake them up, to say, this is not okay. You can't keep living like this. You're hurting yourselves. You're hurting the other person you're involved with, and you're hurting the church, and you're definitely hurting the witness of Christ to the rest of the city and to the community. You're out of line with Jesus' teachings and the family of Christ. This is unacceptable, and we're not just going to you know, whistle past the graveyard and look the other way. So the second point of excommunication is to obligate them to see the severity and the seriousness of of the church's approval. This is not okay. This cannot go on as business as usual any longer. So they have to see the seriousness of their disobedience and their behavior. And then finally, uh, the third motive uh, to, to get the, uh, the offender to look at is to motivate them. The whole point of this discipline is to help change their behavior, to motivate them to repent and to change their bad behavior. Um, another thing in this case, the, and this is now looking at the church, so not just at the individual and what you're trying to do to help them wake up, see the errors of their ways, see how serious it is, turn back to God in repentance. That's for the individual. But now Paul's going to shift over to the church and he says, look, church, if you keep allowing this to go on, this is going to be poison in the life of the congregation. So the integrity of the church is at stake. Is the church going to stand for something? Is the church going to be a catalyst in our society for godly, God-honoring behavior? Or is the church morally going to be no different than the rest of society? The people who don't follow Jesus, the people who don't commit to live a life that is set apart and supposedly pleasing to God. In the moral behavior, if, if the moral behavior in our church if it's no different from the behavior that's out in the community around us, folks, we are in trouble. We have no more witness. We're not going to be different. We're not going to stand out at all. We're no longer acting like the salt of the earth, which is what Jesus phrased that says this is what helps prevent moral decay in our culture. We would be no longer acting like the light of the world, dispelling darkness and calling out people to live a life that honors our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said these words in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, that, in other words, if the salt is no longer preventing spoiling in our church or in our society, 
then how can it be made salty again? If it's, it's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and to be trampled by men. So you have this sinner that they're trying to get this, this person involved in sexual sin to change his ways. The entire church uh, uh, health is at stake. And Paul goes on in verse 6 and he says these words in 1 Corinthians 5. He says, your boasting about this is terrible. Don't you realize that this sin is like a little yeast that spreads through the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast by removing this wicked person from among you. Then you'll be like a fresh batch of dough made without yeast, which is what you really are. Now, anybody with a Jewish background knows exactly what Paul's talking about here. Anybody with a Jewish background, every spring in the week or two before Passover, they had a ritual that they did every time. They would go in their homes and they would find any item of food in their entire household that had yeast in it, and they would take it out of the household. It was a, a ritual that was uh, with the understanding that yeast represents sin, yeast represents evil, influence, and so they had to remove that out in order to celebrate the feast of unleavened bread. In other words, bread without yeast. And Paul is saying, look, if you don't get rid of this yeasty dough, that, that yeast, the yeast in your dough, this sexual sin that's going on in your church and you're not disciplining it, this sexual sin, this influence, this bad influence in your church, it's going to spread throughout the entire congregation. It's going to be like poison in your congregation. So you need to get rid of it. Um, you need to keep your witness. And so Paul gives this illustration uh, with the Jews celebrating Passover, and, he, and he's saying this, what is going to happen in this church, what is, here's what Paul's thinking, what's going to happen in this church if this outrageous behavior is allowed to continue without any discipline? It's going to infect the whole church, it's going to erode their standards for holy living, and so Paul says these words in verse 8, so instead, get rid of that yeast, that evil influence, and he says, let us celebrate the festival let us celebrate the festival not with the old bread of wickedness and evil, but with the new bread of sincerity and truth. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 8. So in other words, Paul's saying, you know what the moral antidote to sin is? The moral antidote to sin is purity. And sincerity is the antidote to hypocrisy. You get rid of the hypocrisy by tolerating this sin. You go back to a pure standard of living and then you have sincerity and you won't have any more hypocrisy in the church. You're not going to have any more, in, any more in evil influence and it's not going to poison the congregation. So he says to the person involved in the sexual sin that's unrepentant, they need to be disfellowshipped for a time to shock them, to obligate them to see their bad ways and to motivate them to repent and to return to God. Now, Paul shifts gears, and Paul's saying, okay, we've talked about this individual, what to do with him. We've talked about the church and what the church needs to do, but now we need to talk about the church's attitude, not toward your brothers and sisters who are in the church, who are claiming to be followers of Christ, but what is the church's attitude toward people who are outside the church? And so Paul says this, when I wrote to you before, I told you not to associate with people who indulge in sexual sin. Sounds like good advice, except, wait a minute, wait a minute, people inside the church or outside the church? And he says, but I wasn't talking about believers who indulge in sexual sin or who are greedy or who cheat people or who worship idols. He says, if you have to avoid all people who are involved with that, you would have to leave this world to avoid people like that. So Paul's saying, look, I'm not talking about avoiding anybody outside the church that acts this way. I was only referring to people who are inside the church the church. And Paul says this, it isn't my response. Oh, he, Paul says this in verse 11. I meant that you're not to associate with anyone who claims to be a believer yet indulges in sexual sin or is greedy or worships idols or is abusive or is a drunkard or cheats people. Don't even, don't even eat with such people. And remember what the category is. If you're going to avoid people like that, Paul says, I'm only telling you to not associate with people like anyone who claims to be a believer, who says I'm a Christ follower and yet has this lifestyle that they haven't changed very much at all in their pagan lifestyle. God will judge 
Oh, and here's Paul in verse 12. It isn't my responsibility to judge outsiders, but it certainly is your responsibility to judge those inside the church who are sinning. God will judge those on the outside, but as the scriptures say, you must remove the evil person from among you. Uh, that is a quote that is probably, you can read four or five or six times in the book of Deuteronomy. Every time it talks about dealing with sin in their community and God's people in Israel, it was saying, here's how you got to handle this sin. Remove the evil from among you. Purge the evil from among you. And that's, that was a quote from Deuteronomy in many places. So Paul isn't saying not to associate with unbelievers. I hope I hope that's really clear. Paul's, Paul's not saying, hey, anybody who acts like a sinner out there, avoid them. Paul's not saying that at all. Paul's, not, Paul's only talking about those inside the church, not those outside the church. What, is Jesus, um, what did Jesus do with people outside the church? How did Jesus model for us how to act toward people who were not yet believers in Christ? I mean, didn't Jesus actually model involvement? with the world and not isolation from it? Didn't Jesus pray in John chapter 17 for his own followers when he said, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world. My prayer is that you would protect them from the evil one. We're to be in the world. We're not to be of the world. We're not to be just like the rest of the world, but we are to be in the world. How can we be salt? How can we be light if we are not being a good godly influence in the world? So he's, he's not talking about shunning people who are out there in the world. That's like saying, hey, uh, before you come into the church, you need to clean up your life, right? And you may have heard that. You may have even thought that at some point in your life. Hey, you know, if I'm going to be a Christian, if I'm going to join the church, I have really got to get my life together. I got to stop doing this, this, and this, and I need to start doing this other thing. And then maybe if I get to a certain level of morality, maybe then I'll be ready to join the church. And that's not Jesus' way at all. Jesus' way at all says, come to me, you are weary and heavy burden, and I will give you rest. Jesus says, come to me, and he will then accept us and love us, welcome us into his family, and then he will start showing us places in our lives that maybe don't line up with loving God with all of our heart and loving our neighbor as ourself. But Jesus, we come to Jesus first, and then he helps us start to change our lives. We don't demand that people change their lives in order to get into the church. So there, it, it's very clear. So you, we're talking about an individual sin. We're talking about the effect on the church. And then we're talking about our attitude toward people who are outside the church. In the church, this, this is an important practice for the church. It's called the exercise of ban. Every local church has the right to determine who its members are and who its members are not. And if there's an obvious sinful activity that is confronted and there is no willingness to change, but just defiant obstinance, then it is incumbent upon our church leadership to declare that that offending person, for a time at least, has been, quote, disfellowshipped from our church. A church that honors God and his word must exercise discipline in calling out and rebuking sin. And I made a little bottom line statement just to remind us what we're talking about. Did you say, well, I don't I, He talked for 40 minutes. I don't know what he said. But you can, maybe you can remember this. Maybe you can remember at least this part, right? For the church to be devout, we have to call sin out. If we're going to be the true church, for the church to be devout, we have to call sin out. So Paul condemns, this is a conclusion here, just to wrap it all up. Paul's condemning this public, unrepentant sexual sin by a church member. He said, that's not okay. You can't allow that to go on anymore. You can't just whistle past it and look the other way, or you can't even start boasting about it and saying freedom in Christ. Wrong attitudes. You need to deal with this. Number two, he's rebuking their church for the arrogance on the matter, for its failure to discipline the violator. Number three, Paul reminds the believers that, hey guys, we're supposed to live holy lives. When we became followers of Jesus, he says, you know, be like me, act like me. Paul is saying, be imitators of me, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ because Paul is trying to live a life holy and set apart unto God. And he says, if you just imitate me, it's not, I'm not perfect, but you'll be on a better track than what you were before. 
They're supposed to live lives that are consecrated to the Lord. And then finally, number four, and we're going to talk about this in more detail next week. It really matters to God. It matters to God what you and I do with our bodies. We're going to uh, uh, really dig into this next chapter next week. Again, one more reminder, bottom line for us, the message for today, for the church to be devout, we have to call sin out. Paul says it this way when he's closing off the letter to the Thessalonians. He's talking about all of us, body, soul, and spirit. And he says, may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. And I want to leave you with a word of hope because I know it's been a heavy message, but I want to leave you with this word of hope. David Pryor, this commentator, says about the church to, about the church. And he says, the whole world is waiting to see such a church, a church which takes sin seriously, but a church which also enjoys forgiveness fully, a church which in its time of gathering together combines joyful celebration with an awesome sense of God's immediacy and authority. A church like that is a church full of love, of joy, of forgiveness, and holiness. And friends, let's be that kind of church. Will you bow with me for a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, God, above all, we just recognize that you are holy. You are morally perfect. God, you are light, and in you there is no darkness at all. And Lord, we want to reflect your character in our lives. We want to become more like you and less like our old selves. And so, Father, give us, the, give us the encouragement, give us the charge to courageously examine ourselves, to see if there's anything in our lives, any habit, any attitude, any practice that is displeasing to you. God, give us the courage to confront it and to turn around and to begin by faith, by committing ourselves to follow you wholeheartedly, by committing to live differently. Help us live in such a way that honors you and that honors other people. And perhaps as our eyes are still closed, perhaps today if you're here, today might be the day where you really understand in a new way, and you become aware in a way that you haven't before, that Jesus doesn't just call us to believe in him. Jesus says, if you want to follow me, you need to deny yourself. You need to pick up your cross every day, and you need to follow me. And so, Lord, I pray for each one of us, if, as we understand that, God, help us to surrender our selfish will and to say to you, Lord Jesus, Lord, your will be done in my life. I am yours, Lord. Everything I am, help me to live completely for you. Help me to follow your rules and not my own. Help me to live in such a way that the world will see you in me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.